Revelation chapter 1. Verse 17. Revelation 1, verse 17, beginning there. And the Bible says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let us pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for grace and mercy, Father. We thank you, Lord, for waking us up, Lord. We thank you, Father, for saving us, God. Father, some of us, we were in some very bad situations, God. We were in a bad condition, Lord. Some of us were hooked on drugs, Lord, and never thought that we would come into our right state of mind again, Father. Some of us lost homes and families and, and spouses, God. Some of us, God, we were on our deathbed, Lord, but you raised us up, Lord. You touched us, God. You made a way where there was no way. Some of us were lost and confused and loneliness and despair, Father. Some of us were even suicidal, Father. But, Lord, you came through, Father. You saved saved us, God. You delivered us. You changed us, God. You pulled us out of a miry pit, God. You cleaned us up, God, and put a new song in our heart, Father. We have jobs, God. We have careers. We have businesses. We have spouses, beautiful children, God. Father, we thank you today, God, for all that you've given to us, God. We don't deserve any of it, Father, but God, we ask today, God, that we would come to our senses, God, and Father, that we would be reminded today, God, that Lord, we committed our lives to you, Father. We said, Lord, that we would serve you God if you would just save us and deliver us God that we would do anything for you Lord and Father today let us come to that place God of recommitment God I pray that you bless your church give us ears to hear what your spirit would speak to us today in Jesus name we all say amen and amen you can go ahead and be seated this morning in closing the first chapter amen hear what we have just read we have the effect of the vision and then also the commission the effect of what John saw, amen, and how, amen, this, amen, affected him, but then also the commission that he was given, amen, to write things down. See, John, the Bible says, fell dead or as dead. The vision was overwhelming. See, a lot of people, I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. Hello, somebody, right? Amen. John here, remember, this is the John, amen, the beloved, who used to, amen, put his head on the bosom of Christ, Hello, somebody. This is John the Beloved. And all of a sudden now he has a vision, amen, of the glorified Christ in heaven. And now he says that he falls as dead at his feet. This vision that he had of Christ, amen, the glorified Christ, was overwhelming. But when he put his hand on him, this now being Christ, he testifies to him as being the first and the last the living one. He says he was dead and is alive forevermore and has the keys to death in Hades. See, this was to, to be a comfort for John, right? He says, don't be afraid. That even in the midst, listen, why would John be afraid? Listen, because we're sinners in the presence of a holy God. See, and, and a lot of times we have a tendency to forget that, that we are sinners, and that we serve a holy God. Amen. Or maybe we, we, we do know that we're sinners. But we forget that he's a holy God. He tells him, don't be afraid. Then he follows the command now to write what we have covered. We covered it in the last, amen, the first two sermons. We covered what, amen, he tells him to write in the introduction. Regarding the seven lampstands and the seven churches, we talked about, amen, that last week. Now, we have come to the conclusion of the first division of the book, right? Things which thou hast seen. 
The things which thou hast seen has to do with the vision of the Son of Man in the midst of the seven lampstands. In other words, amen, things which thou hast seen, which we'll get to right now in verse 19. The things that John has seen, amen, it opens up with the glorified Christ. We see him as judge. We see him now, amen, as judge. Why? Because ultimately, amen, his time as advocate and his time, amen, as intercessor, amen, he is now switching offices. And that's important because the time of the church then is about to come to an end, right? And so we, he sees Christ as he is, amen, getting ready to come back at the day of the Lord. But now what we have, which we we'll get into the second Amen. Division of the book is he is given a vision now, amen, of the church or the church age. Right before Jesus is about to come back, he is now given, amen, a vision regarding the church age, which will consist of church history, right? We, the church, are still here, amen. There's still, amen, future wise, there's still things for us to do. But in these seven Churches, we are going to get a good description of the condition of the church throughout the age. As we now begin the second division, these now are going to cover the things which are, amen, which consists of the church. This is a description or prophetic outline of the spiritual history of the church. From the time John wrote the book in AD 96 down to the taking out of the church. So Jesus now tells John, right, to write the things which thou hast seen. And that was the glorified Christ, right? The glorified Son of Man. We've seen him as the Ancient of Days. We talked about his hair and his eyes and his feet and so forth. But now he is being told to write about the things which are, the things that, amen, were going on in the time of John's day up until today and ultimately will end at the taking out of the church, this now is going to give us, as I mentioned, an outline of the spiritual history of the church, again, from the time that John wrote to the time that the church is taken out. Now, while the character of the seven churches that we are going to cover is descriptive of the church during seven periods of her history, the condition of those churches, listen to me, were their exact condition in John's day. So John now, Right before we get into the first church, John is given this instruction to write seven letters to seven churches. Now, mind you, there were more churches than just seven at the time of John's writing. But these seven churches that the Lord wanted John to write to, right, will consist of seven conditions, right, that the church as a whole will go through from its birth all the way to its taking out. They will give us a picture of what the church has gone through, amen, throughout the age, from its beginning until the very end. It gives us insight as to the condition of the church. However, at the time of John's writing, these literal seven churches received these seven letters for them. Okay? So they were given in John's time to seven churches, but they speak to us prophetically about the condition, seven periods of church history, amen, that speak to you and I about the condition of the church, amen. They could be at different times or, amen, it represents the church as a whole, okay, which we'll cover a little bit more as we move forward here. At the close of the first century, the leaving of the false doctrine or false doctrine was already at work in these churches. That's something that we need to take mind of or take note of. That already as we will look, amen, in the book of uh, um, the first church, the first letter to Ephesus, that already there were false apostles, right? Already there was false doctrines that already had been stirred up and been, amen, spread, It was already at work back then. As we cover the seven churches now, they're given in the order that are named in Scripture because the characteristics of that church applied to the period of church history 
which it is given. Okay? So when that church, the first church is mentioned, amen, its name and also its character, amen, speak to the time that it was in. Right? So I'll give you an example. We're going to get a little ahead of ourselves. But when we speak about the final church, the final church is the Laodicean church. It is known as the lukewarm church. Right? This speaks that very simply that this will be the condition of the church in the end. That the church will be lukewarm in the end. That is the time that we're living in now. Amen. And so, amen, the Bible speaks regarding the condition of the church as a whole in the end. That it will be lukewarm. From the beginning, right? We have the name of the church, its condition, and the time period, amen, and the things that it was going through in that time period. Now, this is important because remember when we talked about the book of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar's vision of this, amen, statue, right? It was a head of gold, right? It had the shoulders of silver, amen, the, the abdomen of brass, the legs of, of iron, and the feet were iron mixed with clay. Each one of those metals represent a kingdom or an empire that would rule upon the earth, right? It started with Babylon, right, as the head of gold. Then it went down to Medo-Persia, right, as silver, amen, the shoulders and so forth of silver. Then it went to the, the, the abdomen part, which was bronze, I believe, right, and that was Greece. Then the legs of iron represented Rome. And then the feet mixed with iron and clay, which, amen, will be in power at the time Jesus returns, Amen, were the revised Roman Empire, which is iron mixed with clay. Now, here's the deal. Why am I saying that or communicating this to us? Because when the, Rome, when the Babylonian Empire ended, amen, though the empire ended, everything about its system, amen, overflowed into the next empire, Medo-Persia. And then when Medo-Persia ended, all that Babylon and Medo-Persia were now flowed into Greece. And then from Greece, ultimately into Rome. It is a way of life. It is a system. The system will once again, it's been operating. It's been moving. It's been spreading. But ultimately, again, another type of empire is going to rise up. Amen. In the time that Jesus returns with ten kings. Well, that's not in the notes today. Amen. But. Keep that for yourself. So again, as we cover these, we need to also recognize that each characteristic of these church periods, again, does not end with the last one, but continues through the next one. And so on until the end, increasing the imperfections of the visible church until it ends in open apostasy. We have Jesus now giving these letters to these seven churches. These seven churches, amen, represent seven periods, okay? But they represent the church as a whole, okay? And so we see now from the beginning, which we'll cover once we get into Ephesians right now, whatever happened in all of these churches overflowed into the next, ultimately, until you get down, amen, to the final church. Well, what is it? What will the, the story tell us in a nutshell? Is that the church, amen, starts well and ends up bad, Hello. It, it, it starts well. But ultimately, over time, because of different compromises, right, it ends up in a bad state of apostasy. Right? That's what we know as the great falling away. And Jesus now, all-knowing, amen, communicates these letters to those churches as individuals, but also it speaks throughout time and it speaks to us today so that we too might take heart and take note of the condition that we are in today and what, amen, the Lord has spoken to us that the condition of the church as a whole will be in our time so that we can do something about it, so that we don't fall into that. As the glorified son of man, he knew the entire history of the church from the beginning. He knew the coming persecutions. He knew the decline. He knew the revivals, the per uh, perversions of his truth. 
He knew the denials of his name, the depths of Satan, and ultimately the final apostasy. There is nothing that the Lord doesn't see and doesn't know. Now, mind you for a moment, the Lord knowing this, that this is how the church would go and end up, but yet he still loves the church. Hello. Think about it for a moment. Well, what does this speak to us as individuals? Right? Many times we start out in love. We start out, man, on fire and loving God. But throughout the seasons of life, the hardships, the persecutions, and, and all the things, the troubles that we go through, how, how, how is our love today for God? See, the Lord knows his people. He knows his church. Revelation chapter 2. Turn with me there if you're there already. Amen. It's all the way in the next chapter. Verse 1 through 11, right? Read along with me. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things. Okay? These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and all that cannot bear them which are evil. And has tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. And is born and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove that candlestick out of its place or his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Verse 7, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We'll stop there. The Lord now is communicating. This is the first letter, amen, to the first church, the church at Ephesus. In verse 1, we have the salutation, where now the Lord is opening up, right? And he communicates to them. We have the commandment in verses 2 and 3. He commends them. Number four, we have the complaint from the Lord to the church. In verse five, we have what is called the warning. Hello. Number six, we have the praise. The Lord praises them. And then ultimately, verse seven, the promise. The promise. It's amazing, you know, many times we as people today, we, we love the commandment. We, we, sometimes we go to church just for their commandment, right? There are many churches today that, amen, model themselves around commandment, always telling us about the good. Hello, somebody. Right? But never the complaint. Never the warning. And this is important for us because what this speaks first and foremost is that the church belongs to Jesus. The Lord is saying, hey, I commend you. Listen, I could say whatever I want about, oh, but you guys are great and praise God, but I'm not the owner of the church. I didn't purchase nobody with my blood. Jesus is the head of the church. It's his church. And he's communicating to the church. Amen, his blessing, amen, he's communicating to them praise, amen, but he also communicates to them a complaint and also a warning. Hello, somebody. I think as a church, amen, this is something that we should pay attention to. 
something that, listen, if the Lord has, amen, a problem with me, I want to know what it is. Because I want to fix it. Ephesus, it means desired. See, the church is the object of his love. As is so beautifully stated in the epistle to the Ephesians. As we look at this church and we begin to understand who they are and, and, and get a little bit of insight. The Lord loved the church. This is the first letter. Hello, somebody. And the Lord is communicating to them and he communicates to us. Amen. How amen? he loves the church. Right? That he desires the church. But this church, amen, started out with great love for God. The letter, the epistle that Paul wrote to Ephesians communicates to them the love that he has for the church. That he loved the church and gave himself for it. He cleanses and sanctifies it and will ultimately present it to himself a glorious church. A glorious church. Listen to me. There is nothing that I or the leadership of the church can do to make you ready. The only thing that we have in our power is the word of God, the word of truth. It is this right here that cleanses us. Right? Paul goes on and he's communicating in the book of Ephesians to husbands. And he tells husbands to love our wives as Christ loves the church. Amen. That he cleanses the church with the word. It is the word that cleanses us. It is the word that sanctifies us. Hello, somebody. It sets us apart. Right? He says that husbands, amen, to love your wives as Christ of the church, amen, and to wash her with the word. It is the word of God. The word of God properly communicated, properly interpreted, and communicated to the church. I was speaking with Johnny. We were here like till like 1030 on Thursday night, right? Everybody left. We started getting, you know, those flares from our wives. Hey, you guys okay? Right? <laughs> Amen. But, you know, the reality I was saying, you know, my responsibility is to give you the word of God. I mean, the church, to communicate the word. And then you got to do what you got to do with it. Right. You have to give an answer for it. Just like I have to go to the word of God for myself. And when I read it, I got to do something about it, either disobey it or obey it. And that is the very essence of what I will be judged upon. My adherence, my faithfulness, my obedience to God's word. Why do you think the devil strives so hard, amen, to water down the word in churches? To communicate false doctrine to people. Why, why do you think he strives with all these false religions to keep us from the truth of God's word? To this church at Ephesus, listen to this, was communicated the highest revelation. Paul the apostle, I mean, if you've ever read the book of Ephesians, Paul speaks about some very spiritual things, sometimes too lofty for us to understand and comprehend. At the early stages of our walk, they're like, whoa, that's way up there. We have riches and glory and spiritual places, and we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Like, what does that mean? Wow. That's great. I love it. I really don't comprehend it, but amen. amen. But this was communicated to the church at Ephesus, right? Paul communicates to them, to us, through that letter about the spiritual riches that we possess in Christ. Think about it. We have these spiritual riches, but many of us don't know what they are. We, we have these at our disposal. 
But because we fail to investigate, hello, right? Some, you know, imagine some of us or all of us, if we, we got a letter that said, hey, hey you, you have an old uncle somewhere who passed away and has an estate and you are the only named relative. You're not going to say, oh, that's cool. Praise God. <laughs> Where's the phone number? Who do I call? What, what, what is this? Theo who? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's my Theo. Yeah, what, what is this estate? What does that mean? I don't know, but let me call. You're going to investigate. But we have spiritual riches as believers that many times we don't investigate. We don't want to go in and say, what does that mean? What are these riches that I possess now as a believer? In Ephesians, we're communicated. Amen. That you and I are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Amen. We're communicated. Amen. That we are sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. We have this revelation given to us through, amen, this letter to the Ephesian church. It was communicated to them. Not only this, but truth concerning the church as the body and the glory of Christ. In Ephesians, if we were to break down the book very simply, it communicates to you and I the wealth of the believer. It communicates the walk of the believer. And then ultimately the warfare of the believer. It tells you and I first and foremost that we are rich in Christ and we are seated in heavenly places and we're sealed by the Holy Ghost, amen, so that we don't stumble, that you know that you have the assurance of your faith. Hello, somebody. Amen. That God promised you and I eternal life and that we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies so that as you go through your walk daily, amen, you might trip here and there, but you don't lose your faith. You don't lose your assurance, amen, because I'm seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And so when it comes time for warfare, I know the word of God that declares that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Come on, somebody. Amen. We don't fret. Amen. We don't get scared. Amen. Hello. We don't stumble. We don't fall into depression. We don't, amen, fall into anxiety and get suicidal thoughts. Amen. We don't detach ourselves and isolate ourselves. Amen. But we put our head down and we say, bring it on for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Ephesus stands for the first period of the church on earth. And the Lord himself bears witness to its faithfulness. To its faithfulness. We have the commandment. Right, the commandment that Christ communicates. He says, for his name's sake they labored and they fainted not. Amen. They put in work. Hello, somebody. Hey, man, they put in work. I'm down with people that put in work. When it's time to work, we work. Right? You ever work with somebody that just want to talk all the time? I'll leave, I'll leave that there, man. It's time for work. We'll fellowship later. Amen. But we're on the Lord's time. Amen. We can't be talking. Amen. On the Lord's time. We got to work. Amen. And then we'll fellowship later. But they put in work for the Lord. He says, but more so. That was tried and tested them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. In other words, you didn't put up with them. You didn't just receive their nice flowery words, amen, or their made up credentials, but you tested them. You found them out to be liars. You didn't just let them in your door and come and preach to you. Hello, somebody. You didn't take their little pamphlet and say, I'll think about it. Hello, somebody. No, but they tested them and found them to be liars. See, men arose at that time who presented, to, presented themselves to be apostles. Listen, even while the apostles were still living and even more so after they had died. But this early church did not tolerate them. See, that's the difference today. We've allowed society, amen, to tell you and I that to love people is to tolerate them. That, that, that's love. Hello, somebody. This early church did not tolerate them. 
nor do they accept them. Hello. No, I'm not following you. I'm blocking you. They didn't accept them. But they hated the deeds. Amen of the Nicolaitans. See, the Lord commends them. He commends them on this very fact. Amen. That, amen. You tested these so-called apostles and you found them to be liars. You didn't tolerate them. Think about that for a moment. Man, even Jesus would have been canceled today. You didn't tolerate them. Oh, he's unloving. Oh, he's not compassionate. You're not tolerating. We're to tolerate him. We're to... The Lord says, no, nah, I commend you on that. Keep my church pure. Yeah. Come on, it's not your church. It's not your decision. It's not your choice. What you allow in and don't let it's right in the scripture. See, he commends them. But then the Lord touches a sore spot. Hello, somebody. Amen. Have you ever gone to the doctor, right? And you go to the doctor and they lay down, they study, he starts pressing on your stomach, right? Like, bro, right? Is that hurt here? How about here? How about here? How about here? How about here, right? See, but that's, that's what he's doing, right? Because he's pressing, and then if he hits somewhere and it hurts, oh, dude. That's indication that it's not supposed to hurt there. There's a sore spot, and the Lord touches on it. And now comes the complaint. See, listen to me. The beginning of evil are in the words, I have this against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. In those very words, we find the beginning of evil. You've left your first love. Listen, that's where it starts, church. That's where it begins. What is the first love? According to the scriptures. Well, the apostle Paul in his heart devotion to Christ expressed his burning desire to know Christ and to win Christ, amen, in his confession where he says, Christ is all in all. Amen. He says, not I, but Christ. This illustrates the first love. And Paul being, amen, really the, the, the example of what it is to be a Christian communicates this in his devotion, in his passion, in his desire for the Lord. That Christ, amen, is all in all. That it's all for God. That whatever I do, it is all to the glory of God. He says, not I. That's a good one. Not for me, but Christ. This illustrates the first love very simply, meaning that Christ is the first love of our life. See, the affection for Christ and devotion to him was waning in the church. Outwardly, everything looked right. But the Lord who desires the deepest affection of his people knew that their hearts were departing from him. Hello. Knew that their hearts were departing from him. Outwardly, you couldn't tell. Hello. But the Lord knew that, listen, the heart of the people were departing. You know, being a pastor for a number of years, I can kind of tell, you know, not always, right? Something you can always see because you, you learn the patterns of people, right? You're, you're able to see them, their, their walk. You're able to see their attendance. You're able to see their giving. You're able to see all of that, their service, right? You can see when the drift begins to happen. Or... Just look at their Facebook page. Really, I mean, if you can go back and look, I'm not trying to be funny or anything. You can look at the things they post because, you know, I believe the Bible says out of the mouth, right, 
the heart speaks. Right? But so does the post. The post is a, a reflection of what's in the heart. Sometimes we're blessed and we're going to church. You see all these church pictures and you, that individual with church people. Then all of a sudden you see an absence. Then all of a sudden you see pictures now and this and that. And like, mm, okay, wait a minute. Right? You start seeing, you know, worldly pictures and, you know, now the background people are drinking and you're like, okay. And you see the drift. It's right there for all to see, but mostly for us. The Lord seen the drift. The heart began to drift. Outwardly, again, everything looks fine. But God sees the heart. See, this is the starting point of all church and individual failure. Right there. When we lose our love for God. Listen, and, and here's the reality. I, I don't think it's lost love. It's misplaced love now. Redirected love. Right? The passion goes from God to someone or something else. Right? We, 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 we've now taken our eyes off of God and the, the attention, the focus, and the priority, and we've put it on other things or other people. We get too busy for God. I'm not talking even outside, even inside the house of God. But mind you, hear me. This is the starting point of all church and individual failure. Is the drifting from our first love. Paul communicates in Acts chapter 20, verse 29 and 30. He says, for I know this. That after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He says he's speaking now to the elders of the church. And he's telling them, listen, I'm going to depart now. You're not going to see me again. And so he's giving them some last and final words. And he says, I know when I leave, the grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They're going to divide you. Right? And he says, this is heavy. He says, also your own selves. In other words, from you guys shall men arise. Speaking perverse things. See, that's heavy. He says, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. They have something better to say. Hello. Listen, when we get into the book of Revelation or any other book in the Bible, if somebody has something new that has not been spoken about, hello, somebody, in the last 200, 2,000 years, hello, somebody, then, then it don't mean nothing. It's made up. Amen. There's nothing new really to share about the word of God. Amen. Hello. Amen. But if somebody has a new interpretation, a new perspective, then you, amen, like Paul says, amen, you, you search them out. Amen. And you go to the word of God and you say, that does not comply. That is not here. Hello, somebody. Where did you find that at? Amen. And then you prove them liars. Hello, somebody. And you don't tolerate them and you don't accept them. Because they're looking to draw away disciples after themselves. This is where it begins. Listen, what that tells us and what it should tell you and me today is that, listen, the greatest threat to the church doesn't come from without. It comes from within. It's the same thing that's going on in our country today. The threat is not from without. It's from within. The beginning of evil in doctrine or in life is heart departure from Christ. And not giving Christ the preeminence. What does preeminence mean? It means superiority or the highest place of ascendancy. It means above all, overall, surpassing all, to the point that nothing and no one else can even come close. 
Christ is the preeminence of his church and should be. But too many times men, amen, with their egos, try to edge the Lord out of the way and want to be the preeminence. They want to be above all. Hello, somebody. They want to be, amen, the superior figure in the church. We are nothing. We're nobody. We're sinners saved by the grace of God who've given the privilege, amen, to be able to communicate God's truth. But the moment we begin to remove Christ as head and begin to perverse his word, amen, then we're damned by the word of God. Paul says, let them be accursed, which simply means that. Christ must be the preeminent. We're talking about how do we, amen, understand this is a complaint and we're we're trying to consider what is that first love. In Hebrews 3 verse 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be any one of you or in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. See, when we have an evil heart, it departs from the Lord. See, many of us, we consider evil. We think about people that traffic children, molest children, do evil things. But the Lord says, amen, when you begin to have an unbelieving heart, it's evil. An unbelieving heart says, I don't believe in you. And therefore, amen, there is no love there. So then how do we lose our first love? Well, there's many ways, but I think some of the most relevant that we can identify with today is working. And looking at what the Lord communicated to the church commending them for their work, for their labor. But yet still now gives them a complaint of departing from their first love. In other words, man, I see your labor. I see you, man. You're out there. You're defending the faith. Man, you're, 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 you're exposing, you're calling out false doctrine and so forth, and you have zeal for that. Amen. And you labor in the church, and you're doing well, but you still have... Lost your first love. See, when we substitute what we do for him, for our relationship with him, that's when we begin the drift. Why why do I do this? See, some people think it's easy work. Get to preach, get to teach. Listen, you should see the texts and emails that I get. Not all the time, but just trying to have a good day, and then boom. Hello. But praise God. You give it to the Lord. Amen. Sometimes I'm just trying to get to my own problems. Just trying to navigate my own storms. But this office also requires that I assist and help others navigate theirs. And sometimes people put false or unrealistic expectations on us as pastors. They expect us to fix their marriages and fix their problems and fix their children and fix their finances, and get them jobs, and hello. All I can do is pray for you. All I can do is give you God's truth. You got to do something with it. Right? But a lot of times, and then when I don't, they'll love you when you're helping, but when they realize that you can't give them the help that they want, All right, we'll leave that there. 
it comes with the territory. But I say that because it becomes easy then to want to just be a people pleaser. And just, you know what, I don't care about you. Just come to church and give and I'll, I'll feed you something. And just turn into that. See, as the church, many times there's a tendency in the beginning, amen, we fall in love with Jesus. We're grateful. Man, we were sinners. They said, we came in. Messed up. Messed up so that we forget. I wish we could like, you know, just like turn back the time real quick for all this. Remember when you came in? I remember when I came in. I remember the hurt. I can remember like it was last night. I remember all the details. I remember. I remember the altar call. I remember the preacher. I remember the words. I remember when God touched me on my seat even before I went up on the platform. I remember how I felt leaving. I remember walking to my room past everybody, just straight up into my room, singing alive, alive. When I laid down on my bed and just knocked out. Woke up with peace in my heart. I couldn't explain it. Everything didn't change. I was still in the projects. There was still dope and alcohol in my house. But I was changed. I was different. God saved me. He pulled me out of the mud and the mire. He reconciled me. changed me. He regenerated my life. Sometimes we forget that. We forget that we were drugged out of our minds, seeing things in shadows and amen. We were out there lost and didn't shower for weeks. Some of us have been bouncing from relationship to relationship, looking for love in all the wrong places. In and out of institutions, lost out of our minds, lonely desperate, caught up in all kinds of madness and and darkness. And when Jesus touched us, when no one else would touch us with a 10-foot pole, Jesus touched us. He embraced us, saved us, cleansed us. But we forgot. That's the story in the Bible. God's people forget. And that's why we have a Bible to remind us. Hello. Let me move quickly here. Working. We lose our first love many times working. They could have gotten off track, the Ephesian church. They could have gotten off track defending the faith or exposing false teachers. Amen. That their works were no longer done in love for the Lord and his truth. The zeal now to want to expose and the zeal now, amen, to want to defend the faith became greater than their love for him. And it's easy for us to put our work and what we do for God before God. It's easy as you begin to grow that, man, I can I can develop messages, but without going to God first. We could come and sit here and eat. And come into the presence of God without spending time in God's presence first. It's like all of us coming to the table to eat with dirty hands. We're all guilty of it. There's no one innocent here. Starting with me. Their works are no longer done in love. They were still working for God, for the love for God. To spend time in God's presence and in his word had waned. It had been replaced now with their doing for God. Right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 2 and 3, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Paul said, I can do all this stuff, but if I don't have love, 
it means nothing. Amen. Nothing. Amen. And then we wonder about when Jesus said, I will tell them plainly, depart from me for I never knew you. But they're going to say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we feed the hungry? Didn't we do this? Amen. And Paul tells us very simply, now listen, you can do all of that. But if you don't have love, it means nothing. There are many times that I've helped people. And I knew I shouldn't. My gut says, the leader in me says, don't do it. But the pastor part says, give them a chance. This might be the day. This might be the time. But the other part says, ain't nothing changed, bro. Come on. And I give people the benefit of the doubt. Because, hey, God can do it. And, and if they burn me, and if they turn on me and talk about me, then that's on them. At least I know that I can stand saying, hey, I, I, I was there. I talked to you. I counseled you. I could have been with my family, but I took time to talk to you for two hours. I was, I was out somewhere with my family, but then I had to walk away to talk to you for two hours. And at the end, you answer to God for that. But at least I know, amen, that I reached out. At least I know that I try to help you, counsel you, point you to God, encourage you in the Lord. And sometimes after going through all these things, you can become callous and hard and say, forget that. I can imagine the Lord. <laughs> and say, you know what? Gosh, you guys. Wasn't my blood on the cross enough? Wasn't the fact that I took the penalty and the wrath of God for you enough? Amen. To earn your devotion? To, to, to get it in return? I believe this is why he exhorted them and exhorts us in the scripture to be content, to not love the world or anything in it, to stop comparing ourselves to others. Hello, somebody. To be content in the Lord and with his blessings that we have today. See, this is important. Why? Because listen, Satan will indeed come and give you the desires of your heart and you will be enticed and led away from Christ. We want things. We want God to do things for us. We want a spouse. We want this. We want that. And listen, God has us wait. Sometimes God, amen, to us, God doesn't come through when we want him to. And we get discouraged. And we say, this don't work. And see, God is not there and God is not real. And that's why I don't go to church. A bunch of hypocrites. He ain't even real. He doesn't answer my prayer. I prayed and I asked for God to heal them and touch them. And it didn't happen. And Satan will come in and give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you a spouse. Oh, yeah. The man or woman of your dreams outwardly. And then you get married. And you're knocking. Pastor, I need to talk. Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Wally. We need counseling. Pastor Wally. I counseled you in the beginning, but you didn't listen. I don't say that, but I'm just saying. All right, my heart came out right now. Again, we give the benefit of the doubt. And it's hard to Communicate biblical truth to unsaved individuals. We're exhorted, church, to be content. And lastly, stand with me. How do we lose our first love? Well, working is one of them. So don't, don't go and quit your job because I said you're going to lose your first love because of work. <laughs> <laughs> Got to work. The Bible says you don't work, you don't eat. Amen. Amen. The Bible calls, amen, those that don't provide for our homes even worse than infidels. So you got to work. I'm talking about putting work before God. And that could be your job. It could be, amen, what we do for God, ministry. And then lastly, amen, as we have the warning. You know, working is one of the ways we lose our first love. 
and then also waiting. I shared real simply how waiting can cause us to depart from the Lord. See, God answers our prayers in a few ways. Yes, no, and wait. Hello. Yes, we love yes. No, but at least we got an answer. But wait. I hate waiting. I'm sorry. I'm a very impatient. I hate waiting. I bad. Pray for me, please. See, many times we are expecting from God. We say prayers. We go through stuff expecting God to come through and provide and heal and understand me, church. You know, sometimes you're not going to get the healing here. Sometimes the people we're praying for, for God to heal them, won't happen here. It'll happen when he takes us home. Amen. So God will heal them one way or the other. But see, the Bible tells you that our ways are not God's ways. I have to rest in the fact that God knows better. That God will love my wife and my children more than I ever can. And his church and his people. And so therefore, there are things that will happen that I don't like. I may not understand. But I trust God. And that's all good for me. But sometimes our waiting gets us tired we're tired of waiting I'm tired of going through hardship I'm tired of being in this trial I'm tired of all this persecution I'm tired of amen being marginalized I'm tired of being overlooked I'm tired of it and we let it go see that is why persecution that is its point or its focus the devil continues to hit and 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 hit until we get tired and we stop loving God. Listen, that's why you think people backslide. They're here and they're undergoing warfare. But they don't endure like good soldiers. And so they give up. And then you see them out there and it looks like they're living a good life. Why? Because the persecution stopped. Because they transitioned over to enemy territory. And so they're no longer a threat to God, to the kingdom, shall I say. And so the enemy leaves them alone. The warning that we have in Scripture now. The church of Ephesus again to them and to us for losing our first love is, he says, remember. Remember your first love. The excitement of knowing you're saved and being right with the Lord. That's everything. That's everything. This life is a vapor, church. It's going to go. I mean, I'm only 53. Hello, somebody. But I can look back at the stages of life. Some of them are further down than they used to be. And I look and I say, time flies. It's moving at a, at a rapid pace. Make the most of these opportunities. Not only that, but he says, repent. Turn from what you were doing and begin doing the right things. That's the answer. Remember this. You're the problem and you're also the solution. When I consider my situations many times, 99.9% .9 of the times, I'm the problem. So I got to go to the mirror of the word so that it can reflect and say, thou art the man. But then I'm also the solution because when I hear, thou art the man, I can either get mad or forget this. Or I can break down like David. Humble myself before God and repent. And do the right things. Say, I'm sorry. Apologize. Fix what you broke. Make it right. Pay back what you owe. 
Make a connection. Call your dad. Call your mom. Make it right. Love hard. Because when they're gone, you're going to regret it. And lastly, we do. Get back to daily prayer. Get back into his word. And get back into the awe of God. The awe of God that you would save a wretch like me. A sinner like me. How could you want me and your family? You died for me. You shed your blood on Calvary's cross for me. That should put you in awe of God. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve you, Savior. I don't deserve to be able to sing or play an instrument or speak or give out a flyer to be your ambassador, to even tell somebody about you because you're too good. Like Peter, when Jesus was in his boat, he said, depart from me for I'm an evil man. I'm no good, but yet God chose you. He called you out of all people in your family to be saved, to be his representative. To pour out his grace and his mercy and his love and his faithfulness and all that heaven can afford into your life. To give you his Holy Spirit to live in you. If that ain't something to be in awe of God about, then I don't know what to tell you. We need all of us to come back to our first love. Because that's the beginning of evil. It opens the door to other things. Let us bow our heads. Let us come before the Lord today. Let us remember. Let us repent. And let us take action to redo the things that we did in the beginning. To pray. To read his word. To come to church. Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you today, Father, for your word. 